morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come and be with you. So my name is Andrew Agerbach. I'm a partner and director in the Boston Consulting Group. I've been with the firm for about 20 odd years and I wear a number of hats there, but one of them is uh, global lead for the topics of cloud and DevOps, both of which are inextricably connected with the world of open source. And uh, so I'm just going to share uh, for a few minutes before your coffee break about some of the adventures, the challenges and indeed the opportunities that we've explored with our clients in the banking world as they've been increasingly making the move to the world of, of public cloud and multi-cloud and hybrid cloud and every other flavour of cloud over the last few years and the way in which open source technology has been a lever to help overcome some of the challenges and, and reduce some of the risks. Uh, so maybe in the spirit of one of the previous uh, presenters, can I just have a show of hands? How many of you are already running live production workloads in the public cloud today? Okay, so similar to the Kubernetes uh, answer, maybe half, two thirds, something like that. And uh, how many of you would say that your organization has a uh, explicit cloud first strategy at this point? Okay, maybe a little bit less, maybe a quarter of the audience, uh, you know, are, are using, uh, have got explicitly cloud first. That's, that's really helpful, thank you, just to get a sense of, of where we're at. Okay, so um, five, five convictions that I have um, personally, I think these are collective for my colleagues at BCG as well, on how banks get value from uh, moving to the cloud. Because you know, moving to the cloud, it's kind of one of those things that everyone's doing it, but you know, where's the value, I think, is, is, the, uh, is the crucial question. And uh, so I'm going to spend a few minutes on each of these points. So the first is that uh, my, my conviction is that most of the value of moving from the cloud is not so much run cost reduction, but actually the agility and efficiency in making change go faster and um, more effectively. Secondly, that sort of lift and shift your existing servers into infrastructure as a service. Yeah, there's some benefits there, but the, the real prize is actually when you move up the stack to platform as a service and software as a service. The third conviction is that uh, in addition to all these conversations about the platform and the technology, actually the ways of working, the engineering processes, the software development lifecycle, you know, changing that part of how you work is just as important. And I think there's some cool connections with uh, the way the open source community thinks about writing software in extended communities and how uh, change happens there. And then uh, maybe this is controversial, so feel free to disagree, ask questions and shoot me down. But uh, I think my view is it's much more valuable to go with a whole hog after working really well with one cloud provider rather than multi-cloud. And obviously there's regulatory challenges, procurement challenges and you know, other questions that will come into that point, but, but that's, that's my point of view. And then lastly, maybe a couple of words on, on skills, capabilities and, and ways of working. So maybe a minute or two on, 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 each, of those, on each of those points. So uh, we worked recently with one of the largest uh, UK retail banks on their, on their cloud strategy and the CIO there was you know, under enormous pressure to reduce the run costs of infrastructure and operations and had been through three or four successive waves of cost reduction. And he asked us to come up with an assessment of the business case of moving to cloud. And uh, when we looked at the actual you know, specific applications, specific services that could move into cloud. We said, yeah, there, there are run cost savings to be had, you know, particularly for more peaky analytical workloads, regulatory reporting, those sorts of things. But actually the, the business case was quite challenged by the fact there's big upfront migration costs, um, there's new capabilities to be developed around how you monitor the, in, you know, the, the ongoing usage costs in the cloud that can ramp up quite quickly and the shift from sort of upfront capex, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> project based funding models to the ongoing opex based usage models. But when we looked over to the change side of, of, the, of the shop, you know, this is a bank that has a, a change portfolio of a, just under three billion pounds a year. So a really substantial change portfolio. They had just 
huge challenges with just basic things like provisioning a server for a project would take six weeks. You know, every time there's a new project, the project manager has to go out and say, give me a development server, give me a test server, give me a test environment, give me a pre-prod. And every single time, it's six week lead time. And sometimes longer, depending on you know, what special variety of technology was needed. And it was pretty compelling that moving to cloud-based provisioning was going to take that six weeks down to, I mean, it could be six minutes, right? But, but you know, say a week, you know, taking from six weeks down to one week, that's a five-week acceleration for every single project the bank's doing. So if you take your three billion you know, portfolio spend, which presumably is delivering more than three billion of business benefits, and you say, okay, let's let me take five weeks off of that. I'm bringing you know, 10% of that three billion from next year into this year. I'm accelerating all of my business change. That's 300 million worth of value. You know, that funds an awful lot of cloud acceleration. That funds an awful lot of, you know, open source agile projects. And so we, we, we established and convinced the bank that, that the, the prize in, the, in accelerating business value of change was far, far greater than saving 10, 20, even 30 percent on some of the infrastructure. And knowing, of course, that those infrastructure run cost savings only come when you've got the last transaction and the last application off and you can decommission it and, and move things. So that's our first thought. Second conviction, moving up the stack to platform as a service and software as a service. So another one of my, my banking clients uh, had a you know, reasonably chunky application. I can't remember exactly many, uh, 60, 70 servers, something like that. You know, web server, application server, database server, typical you know, multi-tier multi application. But they decided to move into the cloud as one of their first cloud projects. And they were, had intended to containerize it and make it a little bit more cloud flexible, but ran into a few obstacles and decided to keep the existing architecture, which required, you know, due to the way it had been built, required a fixed ratio of web servers to application servers to database servers. And they thought, okay, cloud's really flexible, we can move things in, how hard can it be? Well, it turned out that the performance characteristics of the application, once they'd moved it to the cloud, significantly changed the ratio of application service to web service to, to database service. And, and they, because the ratio was between them was fixed, they ended up actually having to scale up to 900 servers in order to make this application work in the cloud, which of course completely killed uh, the economics. And, and so I think, you know, this is an area where open source, you know, through Kubernetes and, and, and indeed, you know, many of the high level platform services that have become very powerful and prevalent in the, in the cloud world um, is, is so helpful, you know, just breaking some of those fixed ratios, breaking down some of the monolithic applications makes such a big difference. Um, another one of my clients, uh, we did some, some, some assessment of the root causes behind many of their uh, you know, issues, incidents and outages. And it turned out that more than 50% of their incidents were nothing to do with functional issues in the code, were simply down to changes in configuration and software versions between you know, what, what happened on the developer's workstation, what happened in system test, integration test, pre-production test and so on. And there's clearly just you know, fantastic tooling now available know, in the open source community and indeed from the cloud providers, if you're prepared to move uh, from uh, this sort of siege mentality of old ways of working. Which brings me to my third point, which is around the fact that it's not just about the platform, but also about the software development lifecycle. And, uh, you know, very often the move to cloud is associated with an, an adoption of agile ways of working. Everyone gets very excited about, you know, we're going to go agile, we're going to have two week sprints, it's going to be amazing. And you have your two week sprint and then you need to pause for nine months of system test, integration test, pre-prod test, you know, non-functional test. And, and clearly that's just completely broken. It's completely nuts. You can't work agile if you have to have that kind of siege mentality in order to be able to adopt um, you know, the cloud agile ways of working. And this is where, you know, the, I, I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure, but 
but it's very obvious that the open source community has you know, developed fantastic capabilities at different levels in the stack from you know, infrastructure as code, Terraform, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, and so on, uh, up into you know, container orchestration where Kubernetes, I think, is really should be seen as the, the minimum level in the stack that, that, that people should be aiming for. Um, I was really surprised the bank, even, even as, as recently as, as a year ago, 18 months ago, was saying, you know, is, is, is Kubernetes really well established? Is it, you know, is, is it well recognized in the industry? Is it definitely the future? You know, it, 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 I was astonished that, that in a reasonably mature IT organization was still questioning whether, whether Kubernetes was well established out there in the marketplace. And I thought, you need to get out more. Um, and, and, you know, it clearly is, 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 is well established, not only, you know, as a platform in its own right, but as an interoperable platform, you know, between different cloud providers, which we'll come back to when we talk uh, about multi-cloud in a minute. Um, and then, you know, monitoring in other levels in the stack. And um, one of the, the sort of seminal articles in the world of open source is uh, Eric Raymond's article and then book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And I'd, I'd like to share my, my sort of 2021 take on, 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 on what he wrote, or at least an aspect of what he wrote, which is that in, in agile and cloud adoption, you want to empower your individual squads, your individual value streams to work uh, as independently as possible and as rapidly as possible. And my assertion would be there's a paradox in that, that you have to be ruthlessly prescriptive actually about a small number of things in order to enable these teams to have the freedom that they need. And uh, a colleague of mine, uh, John Webster, sometimes describes this as uh, the choice between being Catholic and being Buddhist. He says, there's, you need to be the Pope and define top down, thou shalt, for a small number of things. You know, things like, okay, what, open, what uh, container orchestration tool are we going to use? You know, what source code, man, source, what, what, how are we going to do our source code management orchestration? You know, what monitoring fabric are we going to use? You know, you don't have to define what editor people are going to use. You know, you'll start a religious war there if you, if you try and go into, into that world. But if you define a few things very prescriptively, then you can give the freedom to the teams to say, OK, I know that if I change this, I'm not going to break my neighboring component or my upstream or downstream service because I am, you know, I know that when I check this code in that Jenkins is going to automatically kick off and, and run a set of automated regression tests so that we can all have confidence that I haven't broken the last known good build. And I think having the, the, the confidence and the courage to prescribe a few things in order to enable uh, rapid throughput is, is so important. Another one of my clients, um, we did some analysis. We found that the average time from unit test complete on a developer's workstation to beginning integration tests, I hadn't done anything, just beginning it, was 86 days. You know, if I asked you to go back three months to, you know, what Excel spreadsheet or code or PowerPoint or whatever you're, you know, you might have been working on three months ago. You know, probably all of us would say, I have no idea what I was doing, you know. And if you said, you know, somebody has made a hundred or a hundred different people have made other changes to that spreadsheet in the last three months. And now I'd like you to find out why the formula in cell C97 is not working. You'd say, well, that's, you know, completely ridiculous. What a, what a broken way of working. And yet, you know, there are lots and lots of organizations that continue to work that way rather than having, you know, at least a, a good overnight build or if not, you know, uh, a regression test every time you check code in. It makes such a difference to the speed at which bugs can be identified and fixed. And so you actually paradoxically get, by moving faster, get higher quality code, whereas normally people think, oh, if you move fast, you might break things. Actually, there can be a win-win. Um, one, one cloud versus multi-cloud. If you're after a, uh, a provocative, even snarky view on the subject, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Corey Quinn. He, he runs uh, a uh, AWS 
uh, pricing consultancy called the Duckbill Group, and uh, he, he's, he's great on Twitter. And he, he basically says, you know, multi-cloud is a recipe for setting your whole infrastructure on fire. And uh, I wouldn't go quite as far as that, but I would have uh, some sympathy for his point of view. And I think having worked with a number of banks on their cloud journey, you know, most large complex banks find it takes them, I don't know, nine months at least to get a new you know, cloud relationship up and running. And often if they're trying to engage with multiple different cloud providers at a time, it can take 18 months, even three years before real production workloads are delivering value. And that's just far too long. Um, I attended a meeting recently with Andy Jassy, the new head, head of, of AWS, and he was, you know, loudly proclaiming that uh, GE, one of his clients, the CIO there, had set a goal of having 50 applications moved into cloud in the first 30 days of them adopting AWS. They didn't quite make it; they got to, to 42, but you know, he was very proud. That was a you know a pretty a pretty spectacular track record. So it is clearly possible to move very fast into the cloud. But I think the complexities of regulatory approval, of you know, legacy tech complexity and so on in the banking world often you know, create large obstacles to moving fast. And often that's not so much the tech itself, but it's also things like the ways of working. You know, if you've got a relationship with an outsource provider that says every time you want to make a change to your infrastructure, you've got to fill in a request for service. You've got to wait 48 hours before they come back and said, oh, that's a special service. You know, you're going to have to have that priced up specially. There's this sort of intrinsic ways of working challenges that also get in the way here. And I, I think there's you know, if for each new cloud provider, you've got to figure out how we're going to do provisioning, how we're going to do identity and access management, how we're going to do incident management, how is that going to integrate with our on-prem world? You know, it, it's a lot of work to get it right. And if you're trying to do that with AWS and GCP and Azure and, you know, Oracle and IBM and everybody else, God forbid, you know, then it, it's an overwhelming amount of complexity. And even though everyone likes the idea of not being uh, tied to a particular provider, not having vendor lock-in, in reality, you can find that the complexity increases, the risk, the execution risk increases, and the benefits of multi-cloud can seem rather, uh, rather illusory. And I think, again, open source is playing a big role here in, in reducing the extent to which vendor lock-in is, is really a problem. You know, if you're if your containers are, are Kubernetes compliant, you know, it is actually pretty straightforward to move things you know, from one cloud provider to the other. You know, if you really, really wanted to, you could do it dynamically, but I, I don't know if any banks are doing that live in, in production. You know, it's theoretically possible. But the, you know, the important thing, the, the thing the regulator would want to know is that you know, if there were a big problem commercially, technically, however else, you know, how difficult would it be uh, to move things? And you know, this is where I think, uh, at, at the risk of offending the regulators in the room, this is where I think the regulators sometimes are, you know, don't help themselves. You know, just if you look through the regulatory guidelines on, on the use of cloud, a lot of the language is framed around uh, the idea of, of material outsourcing. And that's not stupid. You know, clearly, moving to cloud does have an outsourcing dimension to it. But it's, it's often not considered in terms of the, the relative risk of the move. You know, if I'm a pick a bank, if I'm Lloyd's Bank and I'm moving a Teradata application into AWS, right? Lloyd's Bank's market cap is what, 30 billion. Teradata's 6 billion, right? AWS is 1.6 trillion. Right? I've got an existing app that's on Teradata. I'm completely vulnerable to them if they go bust. And yet, if I want to move that application into the cloud, suddenly I have to get, jump through all of these hoops to prove that I've got a way of you know, coping if, if Amazon were to go bust. I mean, it's just a bizarre way of thinking. And I mean, it's not a completely stupid question. You know, the relationship perhaps with Amazon could go wrong. I do need to have a plan. But you know, is my service more or less reliable if it's running in AWS than if I'm on you know, a Teradata uh, you know, 
old style, you know, proprietary database environment. You know, I would argue that it's actually more resilient, more flexible, you know, say in a Hadoop or equivalent cluster running on AWS. And, and why should I have to jump through many, many hoops of approvals internally and with the regulator in order to be able to, 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 to move it to the cloud? Fifthly and finally, um, cloud skills and capabilities often end up being you know, a key enabler of, of the move to the cloud. You know, a number of my clients are adopting cloud technology, not just because it's you know, of the benefits we've talked about, but also because they want to attract and retain the best talent. You know, we heard at the beginning of, uh, of you know, one of the earlier sessions that, that you know, that's a really important challenge for banks. If you want to be able to compete with uh, the web giants, you want to be able to compete with the fintechs, you need to be able to demonstrate that we're working with you know, cool, exciting technology. And so actually a move to, to the cloud can be a great way of, of demonstrating to, to new young talent that if you come and work for, for us, um, we're not a fuddy-duddy old bank working on you know, ancient technology that won't help you with your career. Actually, we're working with, with some leading edge technology. But in contrast, you know, most banks today actually have had to skill up for their existing landscape. And so there is a real steep learning curve here. And I think the positive side of things is that because the economics, because the way economics of cloud service provision work, they have this, the cloud service providers have these very attractive uh, recurring revenue streams. They're typically highly motivated to help train and uh, tra train your staff. And so they will throw, uh, or be very generous, shall we say, about access to their, uh, their training, their certification processes, um, providing that you're willing to make a commitment of a, a reasonable amount of, uh, of, your, of your workloads to move into the cloud. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Um, those are my five convictions on how banks get value from the cloud. Uh, the value is about the speed and cost of change, not so much about the run that uh, you don't get that much from lifting and shifting your existing tech into uh, infrastructure as a service, but moving up the stack to PaaS and SaaS and making the most of that great open source uh, 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 platforms and enablers. That you have to change your software development lifecycle and your ways of working to, to move from the sort of siege project mentality to continuous integration, continuous delivery which by the way, doesn't have to be the same everywhere in the bank. You know, the, the, the value is typically in the channel systems, in the analytical systems. You know, if you want to have daily releases there that say, okay, our core banking system, our payment system, you know, monthly or quarterly is totally fine. You know, again, that's one of the benefits of, of, of the new ways of working. And then getting real workloads, real value delivered on one cloud provider as uh, I, would, I would push for way ahead of chasing the multi-cloud, you know, even if it means having to work hard with the regulator and with your internal uh, procurement and other approvals and invest in those cloud skills and capabilities, including all the great open source tools that are available. I hope that resonates. I'd be very happy to, to take uh, questions, maybe over coffee. I don't want to keep, keep you from your coffee break any further. And uh, looking forward to uh, joining you for the rest of the day. Thank you very much.